بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته This is Riyad Razazi. We're coming you all back to the uh, Sira series um, entitled Walking with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I hope you're all doing great. I hope you're all doing, uh, staying healthy and staying safe. Uh, MashaAllah, Allah, a lot of people have, are joining now and Zakum Allah Khair for, uh, uh, it's been a long time, it's been a while. I hope you are all of you doing great. I've got people on Facebook as well, people on Instagram. So back into the uh, series, it's called uh, Walking with the Prophet. This is episode number 40, episode number four zero. Ya hala wa sahla, ahlan wa sahla. Episode number 40 from the uh, Sira series. And I've been mentioning for those of you who are new to this series, uh, this is not just a basic Sila series, this is uh, Sila and beyond because we talk about the Prophet Muhammad we talk about him as a person, as a leader, we talk about him as a husband, we talk about you know uh, certain, certain incidents that happened in his life and then we derive lessons from them. We went and we visited him in his home, uh, we saw what the Prophet you know, does in the morning, what does he do in the afternoon, what does he do, how, you know, his salah, we talked about his wudu, we talked about, you know, living with the Prophet. So this is why we call it walking with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So brothers and sisters, today inshallah ta'ala, we're going to resume where we left off. We were ta- we, last time we were talking about that, you know, the, when the Prophet Muhammad came back from the, uh, after the Khandaq, after the battle of the, of the Confederates, and then, and then uh, after the Ben al-Mustaliq, this other, uh, small uh, uh, battle called the Banu Mustaliq, and then when the Prophet Muhammad was coming back from the Banu Mustaliq, uh, that incident that happened, the slandering incident that happened, you know, where uh, um, uh, the where uh, the radiallahu anha wa she was the one who went out with the Prophet Muhammad salam, you know, because the Prophet whenever he used to travel, he used to take his, you know, he used to uh, uh, like you know the casting of lots. And then, and like the Qur'a, as they call it in Arabic, and then he would take one of his wives with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that turn, you know, the turn of Aisha came out, and then, the, you know, she went out with him into that, that trip, you know, into that, you know, uh, into Banu Mustadaq. But on the way back, what happened was, uh, they, uh, uh, Aisha, they used to put the wives of the Prophet in what we call the Hawdaj, that small tent that they used to mount on, a, you know, in the... Uh, uh, on top of a, of a camel, so this is the, the wife of the prophet would you know would stay in that you know covered uh, in that you know in that haudij, and then and then um, uh, and then whenever they reached uh, an area, they will take the haudij and then put it down, and then Aisha anha would come out, and then she would stay with the prophet Muhammad sallam. And Aisha was pretty light; she was pretty light. So when they were to carry the haudij. They were to carry that, that, that tent, they would not, you know, they would not feel, you know, if Aisha is there or not. But they knew that she was there. So Aisha, anha, she came out and then she went to take care of her needs. And then she took some time, then, you know, and, and uh, on the way back, the Prophet Muhammad told the Sahaba to move on, right? So they carried the Hawdaj, they put it back into, you know, on that, on her uh, camel. And then they resumed their, you know, their, their journey. They did not know that Aisha wasn't there. He did not know that Aisha was not there. So Aisha, when she came in, she realized that the you know the 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 caravan ha, has already moved. So she said, "La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah." I'm sure they're going to realize that I'm not you know in 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 you know in that haudaj, and they're gonna come back and get me. So she sat down, waiting for you know for them to come back. And as she sat down, right, uh, she she slept. She fell asleep. And then what happened was. The Prophet Muhammad is always to leave someone behind. You know, whenever there's an army, you know, traveling back, he would always leave somebody behind in case, you know, they would, uh, they would lose something or whatnot. That person coming from behind, he would pick it up on the way. So that person that time was Safwan no, uh, al-Mu'attil. Safwan no, al-Mu'attil was coming back and then he found Aisha. <coughs> and he knew her, you know, although she was covered, you know, with niqab and everything, but he knew it was her. So he came, he came down from his uh, uh, camel or he came down from his, from his uh, 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 horse 
and then uh, عنه, he turned his uh, face back and then Aisha she climbed the camel you know and then they did not speak whatsoever salam alaikum salam but they would not speak it they didn't have no dialogue or conversation or Aisha what you're doing here Aisha what happened you know did they how did they leave you where were you they, he had no you know there was no conversation and Aisha she narrated this this is in hadith in Bukhari as well you know in Muslim a very authentic you know story so Aisha she says he did not talk to me Safwan, he did not talk to me. The only thing he did was he put down his, uh, you know, kneel down, made the camel kneel down. I jumped into the camel, you know, and then he, you know, put it back and then he walked. He walked while she was riding his camel. He did not speak on the way. And then when they reached the, uh, the outskirts of Medina, the uh, uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, the leader of the, of, of the uh, subhanAllah, uh, 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 of the Jews, of not the Jews, of, I'm talking about the hypocrites. Uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, you know, Abdullah is actually the, the son. Uh, uh, ibn Ubay is the leader of the Jews. So when he saw her and he saw, uh, uh, and he saw uh, uh, Safwan, that's when he threw that slandering. Himself, he did not slander. He did not slander. But what he did was, he threw in that poisonous statement. He says, ma khala min huwa ma khala min. And they, um, they, they must have done something. They must have done something. But he did not, you know, precisely, you know, slander, although he just, you know, uh, alluded to the fact that they must have done something. Right? That was the, he was the one who, who, uh, who uh, uh, initiated this whole, you know, rumors. Wal iyadu billah. So, um, Prophet Muhammad wasn't aware, nor Aisha, but the rumors started spreading in the town. Rumors started spreading, spreading in town that, you know, Aisha uh, must have done something with, 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 with uh, Safwan. And there were some people who actually did commit the slandering. Haidat al-Ifq. It's called Hadidat al-Ifq. And one of those that, that committed the slandering is, uh, uh, is Mustah. Mustah is, uh, is, a uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a man who's actually Abu Bakr, who's the father of Aisha, used to support. So he's the one who is one of those who actually accused Aisha and Safwan of committing, you know, uh, haram. Another man who also uh, accused or, or spread the slandering was Hassan ibn Thabit. Hassan ibn Thabit was the poet of the Prophet. He used to, you know, say, you know, uh, poetry and, and he was an old man and, uh, and, uh, he was amongst those who also spoke on on the ard, on the ard, on the on the dignity of Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha. So, my brothers and sisters, this is actually you know this qadi of uh, this uh, thing of uh, al ifk or slandering. It is also considered to be one of the major sins, an extreme major sin. In fact, it is one of the sins. That the Prophet Muhammad as I talked about, that is that doomed one to hell fire. One of the sins that doomed one to hell fire is slandering, is accusing, you know, uh, uh, chaste women of committing zina. Accusing um, uh, um, pious, righteous, uh, chaste women of committing zina. It is considered to be a major sin. So, um, you know, again, Prophet Muhammad said, hear the news, uh, uh, and, and Aisha, she got sick. You know, she says, when I came in, you know, from that trip, I felt sick, so I just went, and I, you know, and she did not know what was happening. And who used to nurse her? Umm Mustah, the mother of Mustah. She was nursing her, subhanAllah, right? And, and, and Aisha, she says, I was not aware, but I noticed I noticed something. She says, I know that Prophet Muhammad, you know, uh, sort of attitude changed with me. He used to come and talk to me. He used to, uh, uh, he used to, uh, you know, talk to me and, and, and ask about me. But, you know, he used to, but those times he used to come and say, Aisha, how are you? Is everything okay? Then he would leave. He did not spend much time with me. So she says, I noticed that he changed, but I did not know why. Ali Salatu Salam, you know, why his attitude changed towards her. So one day that Aisha, she went out with the Umm Mustah. Umm Mustah, she tripped. 
you know, she tripped. And as she tripped, you know, sometimes when you trip people, they may say something, you know, like uh, some people say bad words. Some people, they say, Allahu Akbar, you know, you know, the, these are the pious people, mashallah. They would say, Allahu Akbar, and whatnot. You know, Umm Mustah, when she tripped, she cursed Mustah. She cursed her son Mustah, right? So, um, uh, uh, Aisha, she said, don't curse him, he's your son. Do not curse him. She says, don't you know what he said about you? He, she said, no, I don't know. What did he say about me? And then Umm Mustah told her the story. And that's what, uh, uh, um, uh, that's when um, um, Aisha realized, you know, that, oh, this is what, you know, these rumors. And, and, and she realized why the Prophet Muhammad, you know, attitude sort of like changed towards her and whatnot, you know. And then she came to the Prophet Muhammad one day and then she told him, can I possibly, you know, um, uh, go to my mom's house, you know, to be a nurse there. Uh, and then the Prophet Muhammad allowed her to go, right. They did not have much, you know, conversation. The Prophet Muhammad was upset. Uh, the Sahaba were talking, you know, people were, you know, spinning rumors. Uh, and Aisha, she was hoping. She was hoping, she said that I, I know, or I, I knew that maybe Allah would not send, you know, some the Quran to be recited, some Quran to, to uh, uh, show my innocence. She says, all I was hoping for is for Jibreel, maybe to come down, you know, to tell the Prophet that I was innocent. But she never thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send some ayat to be recited, some to reveal some, some, some Quran, some ayat to be revealed, you know, to be recited, showing her innocence, radiallahu anha wa She was only hoping for Jibreel to come down. And the matter, subhanallah, you know, lasted for a month. Imagine, the matter lasted for a month and Prophet Muhammad was really upset, was really sad, was really disappointed because even the Sahaba, there was a fitna. There was a fitna between the Sahaba. There was a fitna between the, uh, the, the Sahaba themselves, you know, some who, uh, you know, between the Muhajirin, between the Ansar, between the Ansar, Ansar themselves. So there was this fitna that happened and Prophet Muhammad was a little bit upset, alayhi salat was salam. Until, you know, so much so that Prophet Muhammad went to, uh, went to Aisha and told her, Ya Aisha, if you have done anything, ask Allah to forgive you. Seek forgiveness from Allah Azza wa if we've done anything wrong, seek, uh, she says, Wallahi, I will not. <laughs> Wallahi, I will not. Why would I seek forgiveness? And if I were to seek forgiveness, that means I have done something wrong. She says, Wallahi, I will not. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, uh, and then, and then, and then she says, Wallahi, la ajidu illa qawl Abu Yusuf. You know, when things were so much on her, she says, Wallahi, I can't find anything to say other than what Abu Yusuf. She even forgot, you know, the name of Yaqub, the father of Yusuf. She says, I, I found nothing to say other than what Abu Yusuf said. Abu Yusuf means Yaqub, alayhi salam, the father of Yusuf, who says, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَنَعَ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَنُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ That's what Abu Ya'q, that's what Ya'qub said. That's what Jacob said. That's what the father of Yusuf said. When, when uh, his children, you know, uh, uh, took Yusuf, threw him into the well. And you know the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. So you, uh, Ya'qub, what did he say? He said, صَفْبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Beautiful patience. Beautiful patience. I will only have, you know, go, you know, I will be, I will, I will show patience until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, shows my patience subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Prophet Muhammad was sitting a month later, you know, this happened all, you know, a month of, you know, of no, no, Jibril did not come down throughout that month for many reasons. There's a lot of hikmah here, you know, if Prophet Muhammad, if it was, you know, if he was not a prophet, he would have said, oh, my, my wife is innocent. My wife is innocent, you know, why are you talking about my wife? And then he will claim that there's some ayat or something. But the Quran was not revealed for one month. A man having, you know, people spread, you know, spreading rumors against his wife, he may do something crazy. He may do something crazy. What are you talking about? The, you know, the, the, uh, the honor of my wife, my honor, my honor, you know, my wife, you're talking about my honor, you know. So he, a man would do something crazy. So this is another proof that he was a prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran, you know, did not was not revealed for one month. So all of a sudden, Prophet Muhammad was sitting down, 
and then Jibreel came down with ayat from Surah An-Nur. Ayat from Surah An-Nur. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jalla now is talking about those who spread slanders. Those who spread slander. So now it is the ayah that came, was revealed, showing the innocence of Ha'isha radiallahu anha wa ardaha. A month later, you know, Jibreel came with this ayat in Surah Nur, verse number 11, verse number 12, talking about the Mu'mineen, Allah Azza wa Jalla also shows the innocence of the believers who said that this is ifkun mubin, this is slandering. Because even amongst the Sahaba, some people, like I mentioned, they, they, they deviated and they spoke in the, uh, against Aisha. They accused Aisha radiallahu anhu wa ardhan, they accused Safwan. But some of the other believers who remained, state, who remained steadfast, you know, they said, this is if, this is slandering. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran with regard to those believers who said, this is actually slandering. لو لا جاءوا عليه بأربعة شهداء فإن لم يأتوا بالشهداء فأولئك عند الله من الكاذب هم الكاذبون In Surah Al-Nur verse number 13 Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about slandering if you were to slander right and you don't bring four witnesses you shall be whipped أيوة four witnesses and there is hikmah behind bringing four witnesses, not one, not two, not three, four witnesses. This is how grave the matter is. You can just spread slander or accuse a woman of committing zina and listen until you bring in, you know, some, you know, four witnesses who have seen and heard. Who have seen and heard that this person has actually committed zina, adultery. You cannot accuse someone of adultery in Islam, in Islam, unless you bring in witnesses. And how many witnesses? Four. As the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses those who slander. He curses them in this dunya and they are cursed in the akhirah. So that's why those who committed the slandering, they were whipped 80 lashes. They were hit 80 lashes like, like uh, 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 Hassan ibn Thabit, like uh, Mustah. He was also you know, whipped 80, 80 lashes. Why? Because they did not have, they committed slandering, they slandered Aisha, right? But they did not have no witnesses how can you, you know, slander? How can you accuse not anyone? You are accusing the wife of the Prophet of committing zina with Iyadu Billah. Brothers and sisters, before I resume, those of you on Facebook and those of you on Instagram, how are you doing? How's everybody doing? Are you guys doing okay? Those out there on Facebook and those up here on Instagram. How's everyone doing? Are you guys keep, you know, keeping well, inshallah? Ramadan is on the verge. Are you guys keeping well? Before I resume, I just wanted to make sure that you guys are doing well. Now, alhamdulillah, mashallah, now she's doing great. Alhamdulillah, she's doing okay. How's everybody else doing? Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. Alhamdulillah, Saira, Brother Shaw, alhamdulillah, you're doing good. Alhamdulillah, Nim Ka Yusuf, MashaAllah, I hope you guys are staying healthy and safe. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Zakallah Khair. Alhamdulillah, Layla, MashaAllah, she's also doing great. Those of you on Facebook, MashaAllah, Laqwati Labla, those of you, they're also doing great. Zakumallah Khair. May Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. I'm just checking on you, that's all, okay? <coughs> I'm checking on you, making sure that you guys are doing great. So, brothers and sisters, back into this, uh, uh, the, uh, into the slandering and why it is considered to be a major sin in Islam. Because in Islam we have this uh, concept of major sins versus minor sins. Major sins are those that lead one to hell fire. And as they of course repent from them. But if you don't repent from them, you know, these are sins that doom one to hell fire. 
Some of them are shirk. Like we have a hadith to talk about the seven mubiqat, the seven sins that don't want to help. You know, some said there are seven. There, you know, there's a, there's a book called Kitab al Kabair, the book of Kabair, the book of major sins. You know, it talks about like hundred major sins. We talk, you know, the Prophet mentioned, you know, shirk billah, associating someone with the worship of Allah. He talks about not praying. He talks about, you know, uh, 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 accusing uh, a chaste women of committing adultery. You know, it is also considered to be, you know, a major sin. Talking about dishonoring the parents. Dishonoring the parents is, is a, a, a major sin. Uh, black magic. Those who, uh, those who uh, perform and those who practice, you know, black magic, it's considered to be a major sin. A sihr. Right? There's so many major sins. So accusing chaste women of committing adultery is a major sin. Is a major sin. And, 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 and again, in here, those who have committed this major sin, they have to provide aware if those who accuse or if you accuse someone of committing, you know, uh, adultery, you have to bring four witnesses. If you have no four witnesses, like Umar ibn Khattab, Umar ibn Khattab himself, he says, I saw and I heard. Oh, people, I heard with my ears and I saw with my eyes two people committing zina. Ali said, Ya Amin Mu'mineen, bring four witnesses. Ya Amin Mu'mineen, four witnesses. And then again, Umar ibn Khattab himself says, I heard with my ears and I saw with my eyes. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, by Allah, if you don't bring four witnesses, we will whip you 80 lashes. <laughs> you will be hit 80 lashes. Unless you bring in four witnesses. I heard with my ears and I saw with my eyes. Maybe you thought you saw. Maybe you thought you saw. Maybe you thought you heard. You've got to bring in four witnesses. Even if you were to see a man on top of a woman. This is how serious the matter is in Islam. How serious it is, you know, slandering someone. Even when you see a man on top of a woman, you cannot accuse them of adultery. Hmm? Hmm? Yes, you cannot accuse them of adultery. They're on top, but you don't know. If, if you don't know, you know, they said, some ulama said, to bring in a, a rope and to bring it, you know, put it in between. <laughs> to that extent, in fiqh matters, to bring a rope and put it in between, you know, between them, between them, to be able to make that statement if they are actually doing zina or not. He could be on top, but they're not doing zina. Yes, they're doing something haram, of course. But you cannot say that they are committing adultery. So, Umar ibn Khattab says, I saw and I heard. Ali ibn Abil says, bring four witnesses. Umar says, but I heard and I saw. He says, if you don't bring four witnesses, we shall whip you 80 lashes, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah al -Nur. Right. So, um, uh, by the way, something really interesting happened here when Abu Bakr heard about, you know, Mustah, who was, you know, slandering his daughter. And Abu Bakr used to financially support Mustah. Imagine, he was his cousin, he was financially supporting him. He says, I'm financially supporting this guy. And he's slandering my daughter. He's slandering my daughter. Wallahi, I will stop you know, supporting him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. In Surah Nur, Surah Nur talks about Adam. Surah Nur, it's an amazing surah that talks about Adam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَأْتَلِئُولُ الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِذَوِ الْقُرْبَةِ يَأْتُوا بِذَوِ الْقُرْبَةِ وَالْمَسَاكِنَ وَالْمُهَاجِنَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَصْفَحُ وَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَصْفَحُ أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ فَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَصْفَحُ Let them pardon, let them forgive, let them pardon. Alam, 
Don't they want Allah Azza wa Jalla to forgive them? This ayah was revealed on, you know, uh, uh, on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. It was revealed, you know, uh, uh, that because Abu Bakr, when he decided not to financially support Mustah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, you know, telling him, Ala tuhibbuna yaghfir Allahu lakum? Falyaghfu wal yasfahu. Falyaghfu wal yasfahu. Let them pardon and let them forgive. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? And then when this ayah was revealed, Abu Bakr says, I shall forgive, I shall forgive, I shall forgive. I shall forgive. And then he went back and he started supporting, you know, uh, Mustah, the same guy who slandered his daughter. He went back and, you know, started supporting him. Maybe a message to you and I. Some people may say, you know, uh, uh, um, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I stopped talking to my cousin. I stopped talking to my brother. I stopped talking to my sister. I stopped talking about this. Why? Because they said this about me. They said that about me. They said this about my daughter. They said this about my wife. They said this about my whatever, my son and my daughter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Let them forgive. Let them pardon. Let them forgive. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? And Abu Bakr forgave. Radiallahu anhu Allah. Surah Nur, my brothers and sisters, it is an amazing surah that you know many ahkam, many rulings were revealed in Surah Nur. Al Hijab, Ayat Al Hijab, they were revealed in Surah Nur. The the etiquette of asking permission, you know, for the kids. Asking, you know, permission to come and, you know, the Allah Azza wa Jalla give that etiquette on how if you were with your, you know, in your, in your, let's say in your room, in your bedroom with your wife, you know, those ulul hulum, you know, those, those your, of your kids, they, they cannot just come and, and barge in and go inside. They have to knock. And when can they knock? There's only certain times where they can come, you know, ask permission to come in. But there are certain times where they should leave the husband, you know, the father and mother alone. Like after Duha, like you know, Isha time. There are certain times where they should not come and bother the husband, you know, and the wife, even the kids. Subhanallah. And when they should come, they should, you know, ask permission to come in. So Allah is teaching, you know, in the Quran, you know, to teach your kids about this, this adab. The adab of, again, of uh, uh, the, the hijab, as I mentioned, was also revealed, you know, in, in, in this, the same surah. The ghabd uh, al-basar, the ayat of, the, of uh, lowering the gaze were also revealed in the same surah, surah al-nur. Many adab. So this is what we call surah al-nur, surah al-adab. Surah al-nur, surah al-adab. The surah of adab. Uh, to lower your gaze. تحريم البغاء أو البغاء تحريم you know to the forbidden the prohibition of 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 uh, there's some people who used to uh, uh, push their daughters or the, the the girls to commit adultery you know بالله. so uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed this is haram you can't you cannot you know uh, 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 force your daughters to go out there and commit zina you know for for money and whatnot so this the, the same ayat were revealed you know talking about in Surah Nur. The telling the وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ Talking to the youth, you know, to the parents, you know, when their children, they reach a certain age, their daughters reach a certain age to help them get married. Also the same ayah was revealed in Surah Nur. About marriage. وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ that if they were poor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless them, you know, from his blessings, from his risk. So when they reach a certain age and they need to get married, help them get married. Don't just keep them, you know, and, you know, your daughter reaches a certain age, your son reaches a certain age for marriage, let them get married, help them get married. Otherwise, they will be committing zina, you don't want them to commit zina. So help them get married. Help your daughters get married. Help your, you know, sons get married. All these adab, all these ahkam, all these rulings were revealed in Surah An-Nur. After that, brothers and sisters, Medina back, you know, peace came back to Medina. Peace came back to Medina. The Muslims were living 
Alhamdulillah, happily. But, but there was something very important, which is the mission. Also Quraysh, Quraysh as well, you know, they, uh, too many wars, they, they, not only their resources got depleted, but they got tired as well. They got tired of wars. Prophet Muhammad, Medina was safe. Nobody was attacking Medina no more. Halas. No one could attack Medina. Quraysh, too many wars, got them so tired and irritated. But they still were, you know, uh, <coughs> were not, you know, letting Prophet Muhammad do his da'wah work. They were still uh, abstaining the Muslims from doing their da'wah work. And that was the mission. Although, see, the Muslims in Medina, they were living, you know, peacefully. But that does not mean that, okay, I'm living peacefully, so I'm, we're fine. No, because the da'wah has to, to resume. Da'wah has to be spread. The mission, you know, the da'wah has to, to be spread. But Quraysh were not leaving the Muslims doing their job. So Prophet Muhammad has to think of some ways. What should we do? Uh... Six years, the Muslims were away يعني, from Mecca. Six years, the Muhajireen, those who migrated from Mecca, six years they could not go back to Mecca. They could not go back and visit their families. They could not go back and do tawaf. They could not go back for Umrah or Hajj. The Prophet Muhammad wants peace. He does not want to go and attack, you know, Quraysh and fight and, you know, they are, uh, they are dead people. They are our, you know, they are, you know, our people, our fathers, our mothers, our family members. So Prophet Muhammad did not want to, you know, you know, spill blood just for the da'wah. He wants peace. So how can I really prove to Quraysh that I want peace? How can I prove to them that I don't want no war? I just want peace. And let me do my job. Let me talk to people. I will not bother you. I'm just going to talk to people. But Muslims, they were prohibited from going back to Mecca to perform Hajj or, or Umrah. They were prohibited. Quraysh would not let them. So Prophet Muhammad decided to perform Umrah. He saw a dream. In that dream, he saw that he, they, they were you know, performing Umrah. And then the, they were, you know, the Sahaba were shaving. You know, it's a sign that, you know, they were going to go and perform Umrah. When the Prophet Muhammad told the Sahaba, the Sahaba, they were really, really, really happy. We're going to go back to Mecca. It is the Ashur Al-Haram as well. It is the monthly, you know, of Al-Haram, the sacred months. And Quraysh, and Quraysh, they cannot fight. They cannot attack in, during the sacred months. In the sacred months, no fight is allowed. No killing is allowed. So Prophet Muhammad decided to travel to Mecca to perform Umrah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Muhammad, he thought of a strategy. Because he knew that Quraysh would stop him from doing Umrah. He knew that. So what did he do? He made it open. Muslims and not Muslims were going to Mecca. All the Arabs were going to Mecca. The Muslims will perform Tawaf, you know, the, the Umrah, and the non-Muslims, because even the non-Muslims, you know, from Quraysh or from the Kuffar, they used also to go to Mecca, right? They used to do their own Tawaf, their own ways of doing Tawaf, which is different than the Muslim Tawaf. So he called for Umrah. And all the Arabs from different neighborhoods, from different tribes, they joined the Muslims. 1,400 Muslims went with the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam along with the other tribes of Arabs and non-Muslims. Prophet Muhammad, why he chose to do this? Because he said, if, if Quraysh let me do my Umrah, Alhamdulillah, I'm a winner. If Quraysh was to prevent me from doing Umrah, then the Arabs, the tribes, will side with me. They will sympathize with me. They will empathize with me. Oh, Quraysh have, you know, stopped us from coming, from doing Umrah, from going and visiting the sacred house, from performing Tawaf. 
even 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 you know the non-Muslims, you know, they will side with the Muslims at the time. So Prophet Muhammad is a winner, either or. Alayhi salat was salam. And third case, third option, if Quraysh was to uh, uh, was to um, let's say settle for sulh, some sort of agreement with the Muslims, Prophet Muhammad is a winner. Prophet Muhammad is a winner in any case. So Prophet Muhammad is a winner either if, if the Muslims were to travel to perform Umrah, that's what he wanted. If the Muslims were to be stopped from doing Umrah, then the Prophet Muhammad is a winner. Why? Because you know the, the Arabs will side with him and empathize and, and sympathize with him, and Quraysh will look bad. And if Quraysh was to settle something with the Muslims, some sulh, some sort of reconciliation, Prophet Muhammad is a winner. Alayhi salat was sah. So whatever options, you see, this is planning. This is strategical thinking. When we talk about strategical thinking, this is strategical thinking. This is strategical planning, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's thinking of all the ways and all the options. What could happen if I were to go to Mecca? What could happen? I could either perform Umrah, I could be stopped from perform performing Umrah, or we could work out some sort of reconciliation between us and, and Quraysh. So I'm a winner at any case. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On top of that, Prophet Muhammad took Al-Hadi with him. What is Al-Hadi? Al-Hadi is when you take, you know, these, uh, the, the sacrifice with you. To prove to Quraysh that I'm indeed coming for Umrah. I'm not coming for anything else. So he brought the sacrifice with him. The sacrifice that people, they tend to offer after performing Umrah. Right? The sacrifice. Or Hajj. Or Hajj, for that matter. To go for Hajj, so they go and they perform the sacrifice. So Prophet Muhammad took the, uh, took the uh, Al-Hadi, you know, the sacrifice with them. Sallallahu alayhi wa And then they moved on. And then they went, they traveled. Khal bin Walid, he heard. The news, of course, spread that Prophet Muhammad is coming to Mecca to perform Umrah or Hajj. Quraysh said, no. We will not let him. He will not enter the Mecca. He would not perform Umrah or we'll Hajj. We will not let him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Prophet Muhammad told the Sahaba, what should we do? What should we do? He consulted with many, you know, others. And then <coughs> the decision was they would take a route different from the normal route. Because Quraysh, they know that Prophet Muhammad, if he was to come from Medina to Mecca, there is this main route, the main you know path that they would take, people normally would take. So Khalid bin Walid went outside of the Haram, the sanctuary areas, to stop the Muslims from entering. Because if the Muslims was were to enter into the you know uh, the boundaries of the sacred areas, Khalas nobody could stop him. There are certain boundaries. Those of you who've been to Mecca or Medina, there are certain boundaries. Once you reach those boundaries, you are in the sacred area, which means no fighting, no killing, no, if you were to go perform Hajj or Umrah, khalas, you cannot, you know, you can't, uh, let's say, uh, hunt, you cannot uh, uh, get married, you cannot, you know, there's certain things, certain rituals that one cannot do. So Prophet Muhammad thought, okay, I should, let's think of maybe a reroute, a different route, a different path. So he went from a, you know, a more harder path, path to Mecca. Khalid bin Walid is on a different area, waiting for the Muslims. The Muslims didn't show up. Prophet Muhammad is coming from a different route, and he managed to get so close to the sacred area, very close, until his camel sat down or kneeled down in an area called Al Hudaybiyah. Al Hudaybiyah exists today. Those of you who went to Mecca, it's near Mina, where the Janwarat is, where people they go to the pebbles, where people normally go to throw the pebbles in that area. Al Hudaybiyah is an area very close to where the pebbles are, which is not inside the sacred area. So the camel came in and kneeled down there, did not enter. Khalas, they could have just gone. It's so close. Just go inside and then they're in. They're in sacred area. They will go and perform Hajj or Umrah. But subhanallah, the camel kneeled down and did not want to move. 
And then the Sahaba started saying, oh, the camel is, you know, disobeying the order of the Prophet, is disobeying the order of Allah. The Prophet Muhammad said, no. Habasaha habisul fil. What stopped her is what the al-fil stopped her. You know, the fil, who's the fil? The elephant. What elephant? The elephant of Abraha. The elephant of Abraha. When Abraha brought the elephants to destroy the Kaaba, and then the elephants were not able, you know, they were prevented, they were stopped from, from you know, destroying the Kaaba. The Prophet Muhammad says, what stopped the camel is the same who stopped or which stopped the elephant at the time of Abraha. That, that, you know, let us work out some other deals. Quraysh, they came to know, oh, Prophet Muhammad is, is Muhammad is there. He's almost, you know, he's into Mecca. He's giving, you know, he crossed the, the sacred, sacred area. But when they went to look, they saw that Prophet Muhammad is actually in Hudaybiyah. He could have gone if he wanted to, but he did not. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted to prove to them that he wanted peace. He did not want war. He did not come for war. He wanted peace. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's going to happen now? Prophet Muhammad with the Sahaba, they're there. The, the, the Mecca, you could see it, just, you know, you could see Mecca just like a few steps away. You are in the sacred area. What's going to happen? Quraysh will come. What will the Prophet do? Will the Prophet go and perform Humrah that year? Alayhi salatu salam. Quraysh is ready for war. But Prophet Muhammad also was ready. He also took his weapons with him. Why did he take his weapons? Because in the he had some, you know, uh, he had some camels that had the weapons with him, but he's going for Umrah. Why would he carry weapons? And it is Shahr al Haram. It is the it is the monthly, you know, those uh, the sacred month. So those sacred month, uh, no fighting is allowed. Why Prophet Muhammad took his weapons with him? It's haram to fight in the sacred months. But he went to perform Umrah. He stopped. What's going to happen? What surah will be revealed? There's a surah that will be revealed. And also, there were some verses that will be revealed talking about the tree. What tree? What's going to happen in this tree? Some tree. What will happen in this tree? Because this tree is mentioned in the Quran. This tree is mentioned in the Quran. What tree? What is the significance of this tree? What happened in that tree? What happened to the Muslims? What happened to the vision of the Prophet? The dream that he saw. He saw a dream. He saw a vision that he's going to go and perform Umrah. And that he's you know, shaving his head then his vision is true. The vision of a prophet is true. Whenever a prophet sees a vision, that vision is true. So, but what happened here? They stopped, they blocked, they're, they've been prevented from entering. What's going to happen? Is Prophet Muhammad will work out a deal with Quraysh? What kind of deal? How is that going to work? Is it in the favor of the Muslims or is it in the favor of Quraysh? Whose favor would it be? And brothers and sisters, all this insha'Allah ta'ala questions we will talk about and answer tomorrow insha'Allah ta'ala. Tomorrow, Saturday, same time, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern, Eastern time, 10 p.m. Eastern time, uh, UK. I mean, sorry, 5 p.m. Eastern time, 10 p.m. UK time, 11 p.m. Belgium time. Tomorrow insha'Allah ta'ala. We will, you know, proceed and, and resume our uh, series, Walking with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There will be so many beautiful lessons that we will learn from, you know, from the, from this Treaty of Al-Hudaybiyah. It's called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah 
insha'Allah ta'ala. We will talk about that tomorrow, bi'idhnillah. Resume that and then we'll talk about what's going to happen after that treaty, you know. And we will talk about some, uh, 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 we will talk about the Fath, the conquest of Mecca as well, which will happen, you know, uh, shortly after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. We'll talk about all that tomorrow, bi'idhnillah. Barakallahu feekum, zakum lahi, brothers and sisters. May Allah bless you, may Allah reward you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for sticking around. Those of you on Facebook, thank you for joining. May Allah bless you. Those of you on Instagram, Thank you for joining. May Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. Azakum Allah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, inshallah. Alrighty? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Azakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Facebook. And assalamu alaikum, Instagram.